Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 59 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Sometimes I interview people and sometimes I like to just share stories, primary sources from the Middle Ages that I think are interesting or funny or just something that you might not have come across before, just something that I enjoyed and wanted to share. And this week, my attention was drawn to the works of a guy called Franco Sacchetti, who I'd never come across before. He was an Italian who was writing in the 14th century, my favorite century. And he lived between around 1330 or 1335 to about 1400. He was a merchant, he was an ambassador, and he was also a podesta, which is kind of a magistrate, or maybe it's easier to think of as kind of a chief of police in Florence. And he wrote 300 tales. He wrote these tales in order to just kind of entertain people. And the the person who has translated this stuff this is kind of an old translation from 1908 it's translated by Guido Biaggi and I kind of kind of like this because these 300 tales are written to entertain people but Biaggi the translator has said that he's only collected in this group of them the ones that are acceptable so he says he's kept out quote those relating coarse tales or jokes enjoyed and appreciated by the rude Florentines Florentines of the Trecento but which these same Florentines of six centuries later consider distinctly improper if not actually immoral those are those ones are not in this source from 1908 but the other ones are and in the introduction Biaggi says that Sacchetti was writing these to entertain so this is another quote from Biaggi, and he's got some quotes in it that are, I'm presuming, from Sacchetti's introduction as well. So he says, he did not propose to create a great work of art, but merely to infuse a little gaiety into a period of pestilential sickness and mysterious deaths of wars, both civil and on battlefields, to provide a means whereby the people might hear something merry and curious, and more especially such things that are pleasant to hear, but most pleasant when they bring comfort and help to mingle a little laughter with much grief. So according to the context I can get from Biaggi here, Sacchetti is writing this in the 14th century, which is a time of a lot of civil war and a lot of plague. The Black Death is coming back and back and back. And so these little tales were meant to entertain people when times were tough. That's all they were for. And so I've read a bunch of these, not all of them yet, but I've read a bunch of them and I thought I would share some of these with you. They give you a portrait of what life was like because these are not these are not about novels. These are about regular people living in Florence in the 14th century. And I think that's kind of great. So Biaggi says of this collection that it's the most vivid picture of the lives and manners of Sacchetti's contemporaries, which has ever been drawn. That kind of uh, sets the bar pretty high. But for people who are interested in reading, I mean, the Decameron another Italian Boccaccio is writing about people telling tales in a time of plague. Here is Sacchetti, another person who is telling some just gentle stories, funny stories in a time that was difficult for Florentines or Florentines. So I thought I would bring three of these stories to you and uh, I hope you enjoy them. The first story that I want to tell of Sacchetti's is one about a guy who's really superstitious. And I liked this one because I think people have this idea that people in the Middle Ages were really superstitious all the time. And uh, this one is about a guy who just hates corpses so much that he's he's really squeamish about them and superstitious about them. In fact, he's so superstitious about them that if anybody tells him about somebody that's died and they touch him while they're telling the story. Like he has to go and touch someone else and pass the bad luck along. He's that superstitious and people kind of think this is hilarious. And then something something happens to him. So this first one tells us a little bit about what it was like to stay in an inn in the Middle Ages. And I think that that's kind of cool. And you'll pick up more little details of just kind of everyday life as we go. There's a story of Lapaccio de Gheri of Montelupo in the province of Florence. He lived in my time and I knew him, and oft times I sought his company because he was a pleasant and very simple man. If anyone said unto him, such a one is dead, and touched him with the hand to avert evil, instantly he would endeavor to touch that person back again, and if that person fled and he could not touch him, he would go and touch another who was passing in the street. 
and if there was no other person whom he might touch, he would touch a dog or a cat, and if he found nothing else, as a last resource, he would touch the blade of his knife. For he was so superstitious that if, having been touched, he did not immediately touch another in the manner thus related, he believed he would certainly die himself, as had died the one on whose account he had first been touched, and that quickly. And for this reason, the thing had become so well known that if a malefactor were being led to execution, or if a bier or a cross were carried past, everyone ran to touch Lapaccio, and he ran now after one and now after another as though he were out of his senses, and in this fear of those who had touched him found great diversion. It chanced that Lapaccio, having been sent by the commune of Florence to elect a podesta during the time of Lent, he departed from Florence and went towards Bologna and then to Ferrara, and continuing farther he came late one evening to a very lonely and marshy place called Cal Salvadega, and he dismounted at the inn, and with difficulty found means to put up his horses, because there were many Hungarians and pilgrims there, and they were already gone to bed. But he was able to find some supper, and when he'd eaten, he'd asked of the host where he should sleep. Replied the host, Thou must go where thou canst. Here within are all the beds I have, and there are many pilgrims there. See now if there be a place, arrange it, and do for thyself the best way thou canst, for other beds or other chambers I have none. Lapaccio went into the said chamber, and looking from bed to bed, in the dim light, he found them all full, save one only, in which, upon one side, lay a Hungarian who had died upon the previous day. Lapaccio, not knowing this, for sooner would he have lain down in a fire than have lain in that bed, and seeing that upon the other side there was nobody, got into the bed to sleep there. And as it often happens, when the man turned over, seeking to lie more comfortably, it seemed to him that his companion occupied more space than was his by right, and he said, Move to the other side a little, good man. But his friend neither spoke nor moved, for he was gone to the next world. After waiting a little, Lapaccio touched him and said, Oh, but thou sleepest heavily. Give me a little space, I pray thee. Still the good man spake not, and Lapaccio, seeing that he did not move, touched him roughly. Ha! Get away then, and a plague upon thee! But he might as well have spoken to the wall, because the man could not move. Then Lapaccio began to get in a rage, saying, May a sudden death befall thee, for thou art a rascal! And placing himself across the bed with his legs towards the man, and resting his hands upon the bedstead, he gave him a couple of great kicks, and struck him so well that the dead body fell out of the bed and onto the ground so heavily and with such a loud noise that Lapaccio began within himself to say, Alas, what have I done? And holding the coverlet, he leaned over the side of the bed, below which his friend lay upon the ground, and said unto him softly, Get up! Hast thou hurt thyself? Come back to bed! but the other remained as still as oil and let Lapaccio say whatever he liked and neither answered him nor returned to the bed. Having heard the man's heavy fall and seeing that he made no complaint and arose not from the ground, Lapaccio began to say to himself, Alas, unfortunate that I am, I must have killed him. And he looked and looked again and the more he observed him, the more he believed he had killed him. And he said, Oh, unhappy Lapaccio, what shall I do? Where shall I go? If I can but get away. But I know not whither, for I never was in this place before. I would I had died first in Florence rather than still be here. And if I stay, I shall be sent unto Ferrara or some other place, and they will cut off my head. And if I tell the host, he would rather choose that I should die than that he should be hurt by this. And he passed the whole night in this grief and trouble like one whose soul hath been summoned, for on the next morning he expected to die. When the day dawned, the pilgrims began to arise and to go out. Lapaccio, who appeared more dead than the corpse, began to arise also and endeavored to get out as soon as he could, for two reasons, and I know not which reason caused him the greatest misery. The first was to escape from danger and to depart before the host should know of it, and the second was to put a distance between himself and the corpse and to flee from the terror which he always had of the dead. When Lapaccio was gone outside, he hastened the servant who saddled the animals, and when he had found the host and had reckoned with him, he paid him, and as he counted out the money, his hands trembled like twigs. Said the host, "'Feelest thou cold?' Lapaccio could scarce make answer that he thought it was on account of the fog which had arisen from the marsh. 
while the host and Lepatio were at this point, there came to them a pilgrim who said unto the host that he could not find his sack in the place where he had slept, whereupon the host went instantly into the chamber with a light which he had burning in his hand, and searched everywhere, whilst Lepatio remained at a distance with fearful eyes. And stooping down by the bed wherein Lepatio had slept, and looking upon the ground with his light, the innkeeper beheld the dead Hungarian at the foot of the bed. When he saw this, he said, "'What the devil is this? Who hath been sleeping in this bed?' The Paccio, who was listening and trembling greatly, knew not whether he was dead or alive, and a pilgrim, perchance he who had lost the sack, said, "'This man slept there,' pointing to Lepaccio. Lepaccio, beholding this, like one who seemed all ready to feel the axe upon his neck, called the host apart, saying, "'I commend myself unto thee for the love of heaven, for it was I who slept in that bed, and I could in no ways persuade him to make space for me and remain upon his own side. Wherefore, with a kick, I threw him onto the ground, but I meant not to kill him. That was a misfortune and not done with evil intent,' said the host. "'What is thy name?' And he told it to him. Then the host continues, "'What wilt thou pay that thou mayest escape?' said Lepaccio. My brother, ask of me what thou wilt and get me away from here. In Florence I have a large sum of money and I will give thee a bill of possession. Then, seeing how simple a man he was, the host said, How unhappy one! May God make thee a miser. Wert thou blind last night? Thou didst lie down beside a Hungarian who died yesterday after vespers. When Lopaccio heard this, he felt a little better, but not much, because he saw but small difference between having his head cut off and having slept with a dead body. And when he had regained a little courage and assurance, he began to say unto the host, By my faith thou art a pleasant man! Why didst thou not say unto me last night, There is a corpse in one of those beds? If thou hadst told me, not only would I not have slept at thine inn, but I would have travelled farther many miles, even had I been forced to remain in the valleys amongst the reeds. Thou hast given me such a fright that I shall never be merry again, and perchance I shall die of it. On hearing the words of Lepaccio, the innkeeper, who had asked a reward if he saved him, was afraid that he would himself have to pay a recompense to Lepaccio, and with the best words he knew, he made reconciliation between them. And Lepaccio departed as quickly as he could, often looking behind him for fear that Cas Salvadega was following after him, and with a countenance much paler than that of the dead Hungarian whom he had thrown out of bed. And with this trouble, which is not a small thing in his mind, he went to one Messer Andrasagio Rosso of Parma, who had but one eye, and who afterwards came to Florence as Podesta. And Lepaccio returned, bringing news that he had offered election to the said Podesta, and that he had accepted it. And when Lepaccio was come back to Florence, he had an illness of which he almost died. I think that Fortune, knowing how superstitious was this man and how he believed it to be bad luck to touch the dead, desired to divert herself with him in the manner just related. For certainly it was a strange adventure inasmuch as it happened unto him. If it had happened unto another, it would not have been so strange." But how various are the characters of men. There are many who not only fear not omens, but to whom it would be a matter of little import, even were they to sleep with dead bodies. And others there are who would not care if they slept in a bed with serpents or toads or scorpions or all manner of venom and horridness. And there are others who will not dress themselves in green, which is the most agreeable color in the world. Others will never commence anything upon a Friday, which is the day of our salvation." And thus it is with many other things, fantastic and of little sense, which are so many that they could not all be contained in this book. So I like that story because it's kind of funny and it tells us a little bit what it was like to stay at an inn and also how you can be kind of vulnerable if you if you happen to have some bad luck and an innkeeper might not have been quite as nice as this one was, although that's kind of subjective. The second story I picked, I really like because, again, you know, there's this kind of common idea that people were so superstitious or so religious that they would venerate just about anything. And uh, there was a lot of cynicism around relics and things like that during the 14th century. And this one, this story gets at both the fact that people could recognize well, a lot of people could recognize when a relic was fake and also that there was a lot of suspicion around relics and which ones could possibly have been actual saintly items. So this one is about a relic, the arm of St. Catherine. 
Very often doth it happen that relics are found to be deceitful, as chanced unto the Florentines a little while ago. They had received from Apulia an arm which was given to them as being an arm of St. Reparata, and they brought it to Florence with great ceremony and showed it at her feast with much solemnity for many years. But at last the said arm was found to be made of wood. Now Brother Tadeo Dini of the Order of Preachers and a very excellent man was at Bologna upon the feast of St. Catherine, and he preached at the convent of St. Catherine upon the morning of the feast. And when he had finished his sermon, before he descended from the pulpit and began the confession, there was brought unto him a little crystal casket surrounded by tapers and covered with a drapery, and it was bade him, Show unto the people this arm of St. Catherine. Brother Tadeo, who had a good memory, said, how? The arm of St. Catherine? I have been to Mount Sinai, and I have seen her glorious body, complete with her two arms and all her other members. Those other priests replied, That is all very well, but we hold that this is truly her arm. Brother Tadeo gave very plain reasons why it should not be shown. Then the abbess, hearing this, sent unto him, praying that he would show it unto the congregation, because if it were not shown, the veneration for the convent would vanish. Seeing then that he would be obliged to show it, Brother Tadeo opened the casket and took the said arm in his hand, saying, Gentlemen and women, the sisters of this convent say that this arm which you see is the arm of St. Catherine. I have been to Mount Sinai, and I have seen the body of St. Catherine all complete, and especially with two arms. But if she had three arms, this is the third. And he made the sign of the cross, as is customary, together with all the people. Those who were intelligent laughed at this, speaking amongst themselves, but many simple men and women crossed themselves devoutly as though they had not understood Brother Tadeo nor perceived that which he said. Faith is a good thing and saveth all who have it, but truly the vice of avarice causeth much deceit in the matter of relics. It may be said that there is not a church which doth not pretend to possess milk of the Virgin Mary. If it were so, there could be no relic more precious, seeing that nothing of her glorious body remaineth upon the earth. But there is so much milk shown in the world said to be hers, that it would suffice for a fountain flowing for many days. If this thing could be proved, as Brother Tadeo did with that arm, it would not continue. Our faith is our salvation, and whoever imagineth such inventions will be punished for it, either in this world or the next. So I just think that's kind of a hilarious story of this. I've seen St. Catherine's two arms, but if she had a third one, this would be it. It's just kind of, a, it's brilliant. And I just love this story. The little afterward note just kind of gets at how people knew that not every relic that was said to be a relic could possibly be true. And so this third arm of St. Catherine gets at that as well. I just kind of love this story. Wanted to share it with you. Okay, so this last story I picked, basically just because I thought it was funny, it features two old men who end up in a bit of a feud over some peaches. Um, one of them is a blind man. And so as you look through this and listen to this story, you can kind of see this blind man's agency within his own world and the expectations that people had of him, how he meets them, how he doesn't meet them. And I think that's kind of interesting to explore. It also gets at how, well, people are people. It doesn't matter the century. And they, they have their, their petty arguments from time to time. Minona Brunelleschi of Florence lived in my time and he was blind. Nevertheless, in many things, he was more clever than those who could see. So clever that there was not one of his neighbors who, having to put a spigot in a cask of wine, did not send for Monona to do it. And many times I have seen him do this, and he never spilled a drop of wine. And he played the game of Zara, and he walked about alone without any guide. He dwelt at the Panche outside Florence, and had for neighbor one Giovanni Manfredi, nicknamed Giogo. Now Minona was aware that in the vineyard of this Jogo were certain peach trees laden with most excellent peaches, and one night he said unto two companions who were with him, Will you come with me into such a place and get peaches? The men, who had only just arrived at his house and were Florentines, answered, But we do not know the place. Said Minona, Do not trouble yourselves about that. You shall come, and I will lead you, and you shall carry this sack. The two men looked at each other, saying, 
This is a fine thing, for those who can see usually lead the blind, and this blind man proposeth to lead those who can see. Then they desired the more ardently to go, and said, Let us go, that we may see this strange thing. So they went, and only too well from field to field did Benona lead them, but when they were arrived at the entrance to the vineyard, they found that it was well protected all round by a ditch and with a good hedge. Said Benona, let me go first, come ye down here, for there shall be a sort of hidden path. And they went after him. When they had found the path, Minona said, Now go through here, and keep to the right hand, and you will see the peaches. The men did as he bade them, and thus they found what he had described. Nevertheless, Minona came to the peach trees as soon as they did, and he gathered as many as the two together. And at last they filled the sack, and Minona desired that they should lift it up upon his shoulders, but they would not. So they took the sack as best they could, and returned unto the house, and went to bed. In the morning Minona and the others went to Florence, and as those two could not keep themselves from relating the story, the matter came to the ears of Giovanni Manfredi. Giovanni could not overcome his anger, and without saying anything, upon the following night he went with some others into Minona's orchard and cut a great number of fine cabbages that grew there, and gathered as much fruit as he could carry away, and did all the damage possible. When Minona heard of this, he instantly divined that it had been done by Giovanni Manfredi, and he began to gasp like a stuck pig, with his nose wrinkled and his back hunched up so that he looked like a dolphin when it leaps through the sea, blowing out to forecast a tempest. And immediately he started to put the road behind him, running at a great pace with his head stretched, as was his custom when returning to the panche, and passing at this speed before the shop of Caprozzolo, in front of which stood a stall, and upon it a tub containing I know not what for the making of syrups or savouries, he ran with such force against it that stall and tub and all there was in it were upset onto the ground. But nevertheless he continued on his way. Caprozzolo, or his workman, who was occupied in pounding within the shop, came forth and looked after Minona, crying, A plague upon thee! Canst thou not see? Hast thou lost thine eyes? Minona pretended not to hear, but ran on, and he arrived at the panche and entered his orchard, and went about feeling for the cabbages and whatever was still there, and lamenting greatly, but chiefly for the cabbages of which he often made excellent soup. And he remained there several days, appearing as though he knew not who had done him that injury. And at last he decided that the matter could not end there. One evening there came to him two peasants, and he prayed them that they would assist him. And this they did. When the night was come, with two sacks and with knives, they went into the orchard of Giovanni Manfredi, where there was a bed of excessively fine garlic, of which Giovanni was always boasting. Plucking up this garlic piece by piece, they cut off the heads which they placed in the sacks and stuck the stalks back in the ground. And thus they had soon plucked up and carried away all the heads of the garlic and left the stalks in their places. Two days after this, Giovanni and Minona being both at the Trebio where it was their custom to go, Minona lamented the loss of his cabbages. Said Giovanni Manfredi, I would that my garlic had been stolen from me rather than it should have spoiled as it appeareth to be doing, said Minona. How? It was so very fine. The other answered, It hath all withered since yesterday, said Minona. Perchance the worms have eaten it. The other man then departed, understanding only too well that Minona had done something, and when he was come into his orchard, he plucked up a piece of garlic, and he plucked up another, and however many he plucked, he found that not one had a head. He instantly divined what had happened, and the next day, being again at the Trebio, Giogo could not contain himself, but said, Minona, at least thou mightest have left me a few, said Minona. Art thou raving? Jogo answered, I certainly raved when thou didst take away all my garlic, said Minona. What dost thou say of my cabbages? Didst thou send them to be sold by Chiaka? By Chiaka, a death upon thee, and on thee, and on thee. And they rushed one at the other to fight, and their ages added together were one hundred and fifty, and one was blind, and the eyes of the other were so turned round in his head that they appeared as though lined with red. The people came up and made peace between them. Minona kept the garlic and Jogo the cabbages, and never afterwards were they friends, but always grumbled against each other, and neither would correct himself. 
Their feet were in the grave, yet they stole garlic and cabbages. Very likely they would have stolen other things too, because dogs who have licked cinders cannot be trusted with flour. <laughs> so I just think this is a funny story where they just kind of descend into like a plague upon thee and on thee and on thee. It's just a uh, just funny story <laughs> of two guys whose ages together were 150. And this story kind of tells me that human nature hasn't changed all that much <laughs> uh, and that we still can really, um, we can really get petty with each other at times <laughs> and that from the outside, it really is kind of ridiculous. So I hope you've enjoyed these three stories from Saketi. Like I said, they are ones that I had never come across before this week and they really kind of gave me a laugh at a time when I think we can all use a laugh. So I, I hope that you've enjoyed them in the way that Saketi meant us to do where we listen to them, we think they're funny and maybe we've picked something up that could be useful from them. So I said at the beginning that the translator of this edition, Guido Biaggi, was talking about how Sakadi had collected these tales to entertain people. And Biaggi really places an emphasis on Sakadi's work possibly being a way to entertain people and lift their spirits during a time of plague. And in this introduction to Sakadi's tales, Biaggi talks about what happened when the plague receded. And uh, it's just a passage I wanted to share with you because, well... I think kind of speaks to us right now. So Biaggi says, When the scourge had passed away, the people awoke as from some dreadful dream and looked around them in surprise at finding themselves still alive. And then terror and despair were immediately followed by the clamorous joy of the return to life with all its excesses, its importunities, and its wild delights. Then laughter and merrymaking were heard everywhere. Suppers and banquets and festivals of all kinds took place, affording opportunities for the planning and carrying out of those practical jokes, sometimes cruel jokes too, which were intended to provide food for gossip and subject matter for the storytellers and professional jesters. So Biaggi is talking about how these kind of practical jokes are the things that feed Sakadi's stories. But I really like this passage because... We are going through a time that's very difficult right now. And we can imagine that when the scourge has passed away, we will have our banquets and feasts and all of life's excesses and wild delights. We can have those again and it will happen. It's not the time to open the gates yet, but eventually we will have our laughter and merrymaking back again. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's going on, Peter? Hi, Danielle. Yeah, this week we have a couple of pieces about the Hundred Years' War. The first one's by Andrew Latham, and it deals with England's grand strategy uh, during the conflict. And meanwhile, we also have Stephen Mulberger, who has a piece about Louis of Bourbon, otherwise known as the Good Duke, who was a French military commander, and it's a really interesting piece about how he led his troops. So that's on the website this week. Awesome. Sounds great, Peter. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you to all of our patrons on patreon.com who are keeping this podcast going. I really appreciate all of the patrons that you are giving us. Every single bit of it counts. Every single bit of it is important. And if you like the podcast, you enjoyed this podcast episode, for example, head over to patreon.com where you can find all sorts of good stuff like subscriptions to Medieval Warfare magazine, either digital or paper, or you can become part of our book club. All of these things are helpful and all of these things are most appreciated. You can find out everything you need to know at patreon.com slash medievalists. For everything you ever wanted to know about the Middle Ages, you can follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, all over social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And I want to thank the people who have been reaching out to me on social media lately and sending me really nice messages about listening to the podcast and enjoying it. I really am so glad that it is one little thing that can help you get through this tough time. So thank you for sending me these messages. They helped me get through this tough time and I really appreciate them. For all the people who want to follow my stuff, you can find me on social media and you can find my books, including Life in Medieval Europe, Fact and Fiction. You can find them on Amazon or through your local bookstore. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. 
Thanks for listening, and I hope these tales help you get through our tough time, just as they did in the 14th century. Bye.